the cloud. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is C.R. Barclay, and I'm and I serve as the senior admissions counselor for the Ohio State University here at Newark campus. Um, this is section three or segment three of my series of um, discussing key points in our history with our with our esteemed faculty. Um, today, I have the honor of speaking with Dr. Nathaniel Swigger, associate professor of political science here at here at our campus. And Dr. Swigger, without further ado, we're just going to get right into it. Um, one of your areas of emphasis of teaching is in political opinions and political psychology, specifically campaigns and elections. So my first question is, after what we as a nation have survived through with the recent presidential election and the aftermath, how do you think um, political advertising is going to be focused or refocused on the young voters? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, this is obviously an incredibly challenging time in our country, um, and especially for young people who, you know, whether they're just starting out from college or maybe graduating from college or entering the job market, are certainly going to be experiencing a lot more turmoil uh, than a lot of previous generations have. And I think a lot of campaigns, if they want to be successful in actually speaking to them, are going to have to speak to the specific needs that young people have, you know, whether that's addressing issues like um, student loans or college tuition, um, whether that's an emphasis on job creation or job protections or something along those lines. But this generation is going to really need politicians that can actually speak to them, I think. How do you think that the young voters are going to um, make their um, make their needs, make their demands known? Well, this generation is actually showing a lot more uh, political activism than we've seen in young people previously. Uh, voting rates among 18 to 25 year olds have skyrocketed, not just in, in 2020, but in 2018 as well. Um, and that's particularly true, incidentally, among uh, young voters of color. So. Um, I think the fastest growing voter group in the last couple of election cycles has actually been young black women, uh, which is really an interesting development for a lot of reasons, I think, um, but sort of speaks to the fact that young people are much more aware of the world right now. Uh, there's a lot more opportunity for them to learn about it. And so I think you're going to see them engaging in protests. You're gonna see them voting. Uh, we're seeing more and more young people who are actually running campaigns and even running for office themselves. Uh, so I think that this generation is going to be incredibly engaged. Okay, well, um, a few years back, you uh, published an article in the, on, in the online citizen, um, and it was entitled, Social Media Changing Citizens. Do you think that the use of all of the social media outlets now, do you think that moving forward with the uh, presidential election in 2024 or the midterm elections in 2022, do you think that only um, social media messages are going to be able to get across to get across to the young voters? Will the in-person going to rallies type thing be a thing of be a, um, a thing of the past? Actually, no. Um, social media is going to matter a lot because, especially with young people, that's where they're going to get a lot of their news. But I think campaigns are going to continue to do the in-person stuff. We sort of had um, a little bit of a natural experiment on this, actually, in 2020. Um, <laughs> I, I, I realize that's kind of an odd way to describe an epidemic, but, you know, we're making the best of it, right? Um, Typically, presidential campaigns do rallies, right? They do door-to-door -door knocking. Uh, but the Biden campaign really didn't have the kind of presence that you would typically see in a presidential campaign. And I think there, there's some emerging research on this right now that's actually sort of collecting data on you know, campaign offices and stuff like that. 
Um, and I think what we're going to learn is that that really actually hurt the Biden campaign a lot, uh, that they were probably over-reliant on electronic messaging as opposed to the face-to-face -face stuff. Um, so the social media is always gonna matter. It's always a good way of disseminating a message and frankly, of raising money. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> but, but there's just no substitute. And we've seen this across multiple election cycles now uh, for putting your face in front of somebody, somebody's face. Okay. So going in a completely different direction, do you think that um, the young voter will understand and become um, um, affected by the political gerrymandering that mm -hmm. often happens at um, when we have a change in a change in direction, Republican, Democrat, or Democrat to Republican. Do you think that the the young voter is going to really understand how important it is to pay attention to the to gerrymandering? Uh, yeah, I think very much so. Um, I, I think just due to the nature of the time, if you have any interest in public uh, public affairs or politics or really just any kind of sense of engagement. Like this is the time when you're going to be engaged. And um, certainly with the change of administration now, like uh, that's gonna have a huge impact, I think, um, particularly on young voters because they don't really have kind of uh, a record or a memory of previous politics. You don't really pay attention to politics until you can actually vote. And okay. prior to that, no, everything completely is- Completely understand that. Right, right, right. I'm guilty of that too, so I got you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now, if you're a young voter entering the scene, like your definition of what a Republican is or what a Democrat is, is going to be heavily dependent on the actors that you see. Like Joe Biden is going to set the tone for what young voters think a Democrat is. Okay. And, you know, as we get into, you mentioned gerrymandering and you know, the redistricting that's going to happen this year. Um, the way that those new lines are shaped and the kind of competitiveness that could emerge, particularly here in Ohio, I think could have an enormous impact. Okay, so staying within the state, do you, do you, do you foresee where the more grassroots efforts on the, on the local level for local elections, uh, councilmen's, mayors in, in hamlets and in cities, you know, besides, besides the Columbus area, do you see that there is going to be more of more engagement? That, I guess that's what I really want to know. Do you think that the, the, that the young people, and you've kind of alluded to it, but do you really believe that they will become more engaged, not just on the national level, but within their own communities? I certainly hope so. Uh, it's actually one of the first bits of advice that I give to students. Uh, so I'm often asked, how do I get into politics, right? And <laughs> <laughs> the answer is show up. <laughs> like, okay. Uh, if you're a young person and you're really interested in being involved in politics, one of the best ways to do it is just you, whatever your local community is, if it's Lincoln County or whatever, uh, like just start going to party meetings. Uh, find a candidate that you like who's running for city council, who's running for mayor, and start volunteering. Because um, politicians and political parties are always looking for those kinds of people. And the more that you show up, the more that people know who you are, uh, the more likely they might be able to hire you. Uh, but better yet, the more connections you're going to start to build. And, you know, eventually you can build up to the point where you do actually want to run for office or you know, get more engaged or, or, or do this professionally. But there are all sorts of opportunities like that, again, particularly at the local level. Um, they, we have a lot of elections in this country. Yes, we do. <laughs> we do yeah. this a lot. I mean, <laughs> I know and people like, I attempt to only turn in every four years, but like there are going to be elections this year, <laughs> right? And um, again, those kinds of campaigns need workers. And I think most young people sort of assume that there are these barriers to entry, like, do I have to have qualifications or do I have to even have a degree? And the answer is no. Like, you really, you just have to have the will to show up. 
and uh, there will be an opportunity for you. Okay. Okay. So then, I guess then my my next question is is that if you have the um, the will and the um, and the enthusiasm, and you show up, um, you start locally. Do you think that what young voters have potential, young voters have seen on the national level and what happens when you do not win, do you think that that will sour um, people to the point where they will say, you know what, I do not want to put my family, I don't want to put myself through this? That is something that I worry about a lot, actually. Um, and I totally understand that, by the way. Uh, if you have been paying attention for the last few months, yeah, you kind of understand why people might take a pass on politics. Okay. Um, but it's really important to, and this is easy to say, it's hard to do, but it's important to not let that stuff get to you because you know people who commit political violence, people who try to disrupt democracies, one of their goals in doing that, and, and there's a lot of work on this, you know, on uh, rise of authoritarian countries and stuff, but one of the goals of authoritarians is to make you feel helpless, it is to make you feel like there's, there's nothing you can do, you can't affect this, and if you try, you're just going to get hurt. Like, that's the whole thing. Um, because once you feel powerless, once you feel like you can't engage, then the authoritarians won, you know? Democracy only works if people actually show up and actually, you know, take responsibility for their government. Um, and so I do worry about that a lot, you know. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to put you on the spot then and, and then ask about accountability. Um, when, if if I go, let's say sixty five in a in a forty five, I get caught. I get a ticket. I get a choice of either a paying the ticket right away, accepting, yeah, you know, I did wrong, or b going to going to court and actually explaining to a judge, and then allowing and then accepting the decision of the judge, yay or nay. Politics, at least from my point of view, seems to be the one area where there is very little accountability as if, if there is wrongdoing. So you have accurately viewed the situation. <laughs> um, and again, it is something that uh, political scientists worry about a lot, actually. Okay. Um, so democracies run to a large extent on norms and the idea that everybody involved will agree to play by the rules. Correct. And, I mean, that, that you would like to think that there would be more to it than that, but no, it really is just kind of that. And when people break those rules, it's actually really important, not just you know, for a sense of retribution or, or vengeance or anything else, but it is important to hold them accountable because that's the only reason to not break the norm. <laughs> Right. Correct. Right. Like if you know that you can try to overturn an election, for example, and it doesn't work, but nothing happens to you, there's no disincentive to stop you from trying again. Like, well, why wouldn't okay. You? okay, well, I, I will ask the ask the question like, um, Okay, for our viewers, normally when I see Dr. Swigger, he is walking down a hallway and I have a random question and I would just say, hey, Dr. Swigger, got a question about this. So in, in, in the spirit of, of that, I would say we have pieces in place that if we do not, um, uh, if we have questions about the administration of a given election or um, of the administration of how the actual votes were counted. There is, there are pieces in place that we can raise our hand and say, hey, I think we need to take a look at this. 
I know it might delay the norm of, okay, here's the next thing, here's the next thing, but I have a question. So I think in that respect, I'm in agreement. I have no problem with someone raising their hand and going through the, the necessary steps of um, validifying what the norm or the, uh, the original outcome was. Where did it go off the rails? I, I, I mean, I, mean I, I, I find it hard to believe that one speech during the actual official certification could take you, could take a group that far to, to that extreme where they're like, I do not believe, I feel powerless. Mm-hmm. I need to do something because to regain some type of power. Well, I think the important thing is that it wasn't just one speech, right? So this was two months of, frankly, a very large campaign of disinformation. Um, okay. Of people consistently selling a lie about, you know, Dominion voting systems and something about Hugo Chavez was in there at one point. I didn't really understand that part. <laughs> um, but it was a lie. And it's kind of extraordinary just to see. All right, so from my perspective, okay, the weirdest thing about watching the outcome of the 2020 election is that there really wasn't all that much that should have been controversial about the 2020 election. Uh, what happened was very, very normal in many ways and looked exactly like we, well, not exactly, but pretty close to what many of us thought the election was going to look like. Um, the vote counting procedures were very normal. The, you know, the democratic advantage in mail-in voting was entirely predictable and all that stuff. And really from the moment that states certified their election results, you know, once they did the audits and once they did the recounts, like, okay. It was over. And everything that happened after that was just kind of this bizarre alternative universe thing. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, culminating it, 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 January 6th was uh, election certification was, you know, the challenge to the electoral votes and the idea that Mike Pence could play the role of the decider. Like, that's not real. Um, the vice president doesn't have that authority, like that just doesn't exist under the law. Uh, And there was never, like, again, once the state certified the vote, like it was always going to be Biden at that point. (laughs) And uh, I think the the violence that we saw is kind of the inevitable outcome of people who don't understand that the process has been followed and don't understand, you know, that the votes have been counted because they've been told that there is this fraud that doesn't exist. I mean, this is really just an unfortunate outpouring of violence as a direct result of misinformation. Okay. So why I have you on the subject, let's say that I am the voice of calm. I am in my home. I am the, I am the deal maker. Everyone comes to me. And I'm the one that goes between the two sides to try and figure out, okay, what is it something that we could live with? Let's say that this was not a, um, a venture into Fantasy Island and we were truly, it was truly reality. All the, other, all the events before the, um, before the riot happened, what, would, what should have been the... What should have been the compromise? What should have been the um, uh, the olive branch extended to the to the group that that is constantly saying, you know what? I just don't think that this was fair. What 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 should have happened? I, I've got to believe that the calm the calm rational folks should have done something more to appease and compromise in order to avert avert this? Because it takes two sides to have a fight. Well, sure. Uh, the problem in this case is that there can only be one winner of an election, right? Agreed. Agreed. No, nope. got you there. And so what should have happened, and what 
you know, to be fair, like what did happen, this wasn't just, you know, Democrats said we won and Republicans said, no, you didn't, right? Like there were plenty of Republicans who acknowledged the outcome of the election. If you look at, say, Mike DeWine or um, Mitt Romney, Ben Sass, people like that. Right. Um, what needed to happen is that those people needed to assert more control and um, have louder voices. Because the thing is, you know, the nature of living in a highly polarized society, which we have now, right, where Democrats and Republicans are far apart, Correct. is that voters on those sides really only listen to leaders on those sides. Um, and so what really needs to happen now, frankly, is that calm, sensible Republicans need to sort of start to neutralize uh, more radical Republicans uh, because they're the only people who are going to be able to reach Republican voters. And okay. <laughs> no, no, and, and what you were saying makes complete sense. Yeah. So as you and I begin to rewrite policy, <laughs> uh, would the, um, the stimulus package that is being bandied about do you think that, again, in the essence of trying to extend an olive branch to the, to the side that, um, that was defeated, do you give back more? Do you say, oh, okay, here's my plan. You don't have a plan. I'm willing to work with you, but you know, we've got to we've got to have some we've got to have some type of compromise on your side. I'm not just going to give you everything, mm -hmm. and the side that lost can't expect. You know what? I want everything, and I want it now. Yeah. Well, I mean, in an ideal world, we would start to see some compromise, right? And in fact, compromise is kind of necessary. In the I would agree. legislative <laughs> yeah. process. Like, no, no, I mean, I don't even mean it as sort of an, oh, isn't compromise nice. I mean, actually, it right. takes a whole lot of people getting on board just to pass any piece of legislation. Um, I think we're not going to see that with the stimulus bill. Okay. Um, just because that's a bill that's designed to address a current crisis. And um, I think that one is going to be passed probably along party lines just to be passed as quickly as possible. Okay. But there are other areas. Um, okay, good. I'm, gl <laughs> I'm glad. So for, well, for me and the common person that's looking at this, wh what, would, what would you pick as a, as a piece of compromise, as something that you think, you know what, both parties can get on board with this? Oh, gosh. So there's actually a lot of things like that. So this is sort of the weirdest part about American politics right now, and is kind of a hard thing to understand, is that uh, we're polarized in the sense that Democrats and Republicans are really angry at each other. Okay, but, you are right. Yeah, <laughs> but there are actually a lot of areas where if you just ask voters what they want, that um, overwhelming majorities support uh, things like, I mean, I, honestly, on the stimulus bill, there's overwhelming support um, from Republicans and Democratic voters to actually have a large uh, stimulus package. Uh, people want aid to states, they want aid to um, local governments, and they, frankly, they want the checks, which, you know. I, I, I'm right there. I'm fair. right there with them. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and I think if if we could start to see lawmakers actually sort of recognize those areas, whether it's something like stimulus or um, something like really basic gun control, like universal background checks, something like 85% of the country approves of the idea of universal background checks. Great, do that, right? Uh, and recognize that that is sort of a point of commonality. Election security and election access. You know, it is possible both to make it easier for people to vote while also ensuring voting security. And yeah, guess what? That's also really popular. So, okay, do that. <laughs> um, there are a lot of areas like that um, where at least theoretically members of Congress could, from both parties could come together. Um, I don't know that that's going to necessarily happen, but <laughs> it is possible. <laughs> okay. So 
I think that you um you kind of brushed on where where the where the issue could be. Do you believe in term limits? Do you think that if we instituted term limits and took away the career politician? Mm. So, okay. <laughs> I actually just had this conversation uh, with one of my classes. So this is, this is interesting you brought this up. Um, I understand the intuition behind term limits, right? Like it was, it's because it's basically what you're saying, right? Let's eliminate the idea of the career politician. Right. But in fact, putting term limits into place introduces a lot of negative incentives, uh, actually increases party polarization because it is increasing the likelihood of, of turnover and control. And what functionally happens is that you end up shifting power away from elected officials who at least in theory are responsible to voters, right? And right. onto unelected uh, interest groups. Because- Ah, uh, okay, I gotcha. Yeah, and there are sort of two mechanisms for that, right? Like imagine that you are elected and you show up to Congress on your first day. Right. You don't know Jack and you don't know anyone and you don't know how to do things. So you're more, much more reliant on say interest groups and lobbying groups basically to help you build influence. By the time that you've been around long enough that you could theoretically do those things, you're term limited, so you have to leave. But now of course you're also, because let's face it, everybody's got a mortgage, looking for that next job. Yeah, you are, oh, okay. So <laughs> I, I understand the intuition. It's just, um, it, and it, empirically it's bad. It's a bad idea. Uh, the solution to the problem of long-term politicians is uh, more competitive elections. What we really need, honestly, uh, what we very, very badly need is redistricting reform across the country. Uh, the biggest problem with um, most of our congressional elections is that they're not competitive. Um, and uncompetitive elections, of course, lower incentives for elected officials to be accountable. Uh, they decrease opportunities for you know, new political faces. It's that's really the problem. Hmm. Okay. So, and again, we're walking down the hall now because I, 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 I because then the, the next question that comes to mind is, is that how do you, if you are not for term limits, how do you, uh, Break up the uh, the thinking on both on both sides where they've been there, and I just need to wait around for enough of my guys or women or my gals to to uh, to be here so that I get a majority or I can have a super majority and I can push this piece through. That's going to be the betterment for my state. How? how do you how do you get around how do you get around that and and i'll be the one the bad guy and i will mention by name the current speaker of the house i think has passed her passed her time i think that we need to have a different speaker of the house in to in in place at this point to be able to maybe make a phone call, walk down the hall and say, you know what, let's sit down over lunch and let's pick out, as you mentioned, let's pick out one thing that we all can get together on and build from there. It's a fair question. It's actually a pretty significant problem if you look not just at the speaker, but um, I think the entire Democratic congressional leadership team at this point is over the age of 80, um, which ain't great. Uh, honestly, for a lot of reasons, um, you mentioned the speaker, um, and one of the reasons, um, well, one of the reasons that we haven't had a lot of new leadership is that uh, Pelosi's frankly been really, really effective at cementing her own influence, and part of that has been kind of uh, cutting off anybody who could have possibly challenged that. So, you know, good on her for being a strong legislative leader, but it does kind of affect long-term planning a little bit here. Exactly. Um, I think the solution actually goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is uh, encouraging more young people to run. Um, we have seen repeatedly 
at this point that yes, you really can run against entrenched incumbents and still win, right? Um, whether that's somebody like Madison Cawthorn in North Carolina or uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in New York, um, voters care. Uh, voters will notice that the same person has been around for a long time. And uh, frankly, a little generational change probably would be a good thing at this point, so. Okay, so now I'm gonna go out on a limb and probably um, just like you, you, um, you sometimes bring work home and you discuss um, yes. <laughs> you discuss things you, you discuss things with your uh, with your spouse. So this question, and to our viewers, this question is not me. This question is completely from my wife. <laughs> that I that I promised when when she heard that I was going to be speaking with you, to get your take on it. But you mentioned, at least in our household, a very controversial figure. Um, where <laughs> um, the the representative from New York, um, and my wife's question is 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 it too much too soon by someone so young and that hasn't sponsored major legislation? Well. I think that's fair. Um, it's certainly, I mean, to be fair, I'm not sure how much of this I would put on her versus how much of it is media coverage of her. Um, and this has been the thing that's actually, it doesn't start with, uh, with Osio Cortez, right? Like this is a thing that's actually been true probably for the last, well, I would say Obama was actually in this as well. Um, we don't care as much about experience as we used to. Okay, nope, I, I see that trend. It, no, this is very clear. And uh, it certainly is the case that not just in, on social media, but even on traditional media, that traditional media outlets uh, don't sort of give uh, special treatment to older members as much the way they used to. So it's a lot easier for you know, a freshman member of Congress to suddenly be on TV a lot or to build up a large following of their own on Twitter or Instagram or whatever. Um, I have absolutely no idea how to stop that from happening. <laughs> um, at, like at all, <laughs> because it seems like this is just sort of the increasing trend of sort of politics as celebrity. Uh, you know, our, our last president is a pretty good example of this as well, you know, older, but certainly not experienced in politics prior to being the president of the United States. And it is sort of a worrying trend, um, but I don't, I don't know how to push back against it. You know, I, I don't know how to stop people from using social media. <laughs> well, and I'm not against the use of the, um, the pieces uh, the pieces um, in front of you, the the tools that you have of the, of the trade right now have no. I guess where my wife and I have both had questions about is that to maybe it is the more experienced um, uh, uh, Congress Congress people um, senators that have realized that to speak and speak so forcefully and so frequently may not be a good thing for overall political health. And especially if you have not, if you have, if you have not done a lot of the groundwork, you know, I, you and I probably would get in an argument that I would say that you should not be allowed to run for, for president until you've been a governor. <laughs> You should not be allowed to run for governor until you have been a mayor. I I think that it is truly a a stepping stone of understanding how government works, how your local government works, and how the little guy needs to needs to be able to function. 
And I don't think you can do that without having been a mayor or having been a governor before you decide to go for the top prize. Well, I'm a big fan of people gaining political experience. Um, the issue really is, so to go back to polarization, right? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm back there. <laughs> so we have strongly polarized parties but we don't actually have strong parties, by which I mean um, we have strong identities as Democrats and Republicans, but we don't have uh, strong party leaders exerting control. And that sort of is a product of uh, the proliferation of things like social media. So, you know, if you're a young person entering politics now, or even an older person entering politics now, you don't need access to the party structure in the way that you absolutely 100% did, like even 30 years ago, right? Um, that was the way that you gained access to the media. That was the way that you gained access to campaign funds and to um, you know, the kind of expertise that you would need to run a campaign. Uh, and none of that is true anymore, which enables individuals really to act much more entrepreneurial, you know, to actually put themselves out there um, because there really aren't a whole lot of mechanisms that parties can use to restrain that behavior anymore. Back to my thing about accountability. <laughs> because once again, as you said, the key word, entrepreneurial, that means that you're willing to take risks for yourself because if, if it fails, it's just on you. But when you are entering a a public domain and you are representing me and you have an entrepreneurial framework set up um, attitude and it doesn't work or I disagree with it, the only way that I can um, make you accountable is in two years or in four years say bye-bye. Pretty much, yep. <laughs> I, I mean, but there's no there's no accountability for uh, for a mistake, uh, lack of judgment, and that brings me again back to where we first started. Uh, how I believe we got into this whole thing to start off with is that there is such a lack of accountability, and no one wants to step up and say, you know what, maybe the state of Ohio could have done their election better, or maybe the um, the seventh precinct within Columbus could have done their, could have made it more, um, at, could have given more access to all of the voters within their precinct. Yeah, I mean, I see what you're saying. The problem is that the incentives aren't there. Um, people cooperate because they know they'll be held accountable. And uh, one of the problems is that we're relying on the people that we want to hold accountable to hold each other accountable. So. If you're a, a member of Congress, you know, you don't want to vote to expel other members of Congress because then you're setting the precedent that you can expel members of Congress. And it could be you. <laughs> it could be you. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, you don't want to set the precedent that you're going to be punishing somebody uh, for going too far because what, you know, what if you want to start saying things or if you, you want to start building up a social media following. Um, and so we're left with organizations that uh, well, frankly, are at this point are having a hard time functioning. <laughs> okay. I see. I, I I still think I I, I was able to, to get a couple points in. I, I, <laughs> I feel like that. I mean, normally when you and I talk, it is usually a two or three punch fight <laughs> and you win. I, this time I actually, I act thanks to my wife. I actually think that I was, a, I was able to do a couple of counter punches that I, I just, I, I just think that there is, I don't see anyone that is truly willing to say, I'm not leaving until we come up with the compromise, you know? And I think that if we took on the more, the family, the family type of um, uh, structure or attitude that more things would get done because I know that in our family, until a deal is struck, we're not gonna have dinner or until a deal is struck, <laughs> you know, yeah. we, we're not going on vacation, you know? <laughs> so, the problem is 
that uh, you're not trying, you're never going to defeat your family. <laughs> but both sides at this point actually have a strong incentive to do it. You know, we have reached a very odd stage where we have fewer actual individual congressional elections that are competitive. Um, but overall, control of the chamber and control of government is very much up for grabs in any given election, right? So, Correct. I found that. I mean, we saw that. <laughs> right. Well, OK, so that means that if you know, you're the Republicans and you lost this time, uh, at this point, your incentive, because you're looking at the next election now, is uh, not to cooperate. Because if you don't cooperate, then in the next election, you can run against Democrats and accuse them of failing. Right. And of course, if Republicans win, then Democrats then have that exact same incentive uh, to not cooperate so that Republicans fail so that they can then use that to try and regain power. Um, and this just goes kind of, unfortunately, is a cycle that we are now kind of stuck in. Sorry, okay. I'm not terribly optimistic of these days. About no, and, 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 but this is what a part of this, this conversation is. I want our, I want, uh, our viewers to, to see these are the type of conversations. These are the type of uh, questions that, that they can pose that you, that you listen to and interpret and talk about each and every day. And it's not just from the students in the classroom, it's from, you know, working stiffs like me that like, you know what, I think that this is, I think that this makes sense, but you know, you're an expert in the field. I'm a novice, as you say, I, I check in every two years and really only pay attention once every four years or yeah. And with the governorship that, okay, I'm, I, I consider myself engaged for like that three to six month thing. You do this every day. So henceforth, why I was asking. <laughs> yes, that's also why I have less hair than I used to. <laughs> oh, well, that comes with the territory. But um, this is a great place to leave it. Um, on behalf of myself and, and I know the viewers, thank you very much, Dr. Swigger, for giving up a little bit of your time and having a, a a sane, <laughs> rational, calm um, exchange of ideas. Appreciate it. And definitely your insights on campaigns and on the upcoming elections, midterms in 2022 and 20, and then the general in 2024. And I'm sure that our young people hopefully will take heed, get involved and be engaged. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. It was a great talk. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay.